The most important part of the story is the end, and horror films definitely know this. Even though it's hard to recall a film's plot if you haven't seen it in a while, a shocking climax can stay with you for the rest of your life. Sometimes we're left reeling because the movie culminates with a jaw-dropping twist. Other times, the conclusion leaves a huge impact on us since it went in a direction that we just didn't see coming. Once in a while, the final scene stays with us because it was just, well, stupid. Whether it was for better or worse though, I'm Josh from What Culture Horror, and these are 10 horror movie endings that made you say, what? Number 10, Krampus. Krampus begins with the Engel family preparing their house for the Christmas season. However, the younger son, Max, hates the entire Christmas season, but no one quite knows the reason. As a result, Max's disillusionment causes Santa Claus's dark twin, Krampus, to unleash his legion of monsters on the family. And even though the Engels put up a valiant fight, they are all eventually slaughtered by the evil monsters, sadistic toys, and carnivorous gingerbread men. With Max being the sole survivor, he then begs Krampus to undo all of the evil he's committed. And even though Krampus punishes those who turn their back on Christmas, you assume here that he might spare Max since, well, he's a decent kid. But nope, that's not how it turns out, as despite Max telling Krampus that he takes back his wish and apologizes for not appreciating his family, the darker creature sends him to hell anywhere. In a strange twist though, Max then suddenly wakes up in his house to see that his family are all safe and sound, implying the horrors he experienced were all just a dream. But surprise, this moment turns out to be a double fake out. As Max embraces his family, the camera zooms out to reveal that the whole Angle's house is sealed in one of the many snow globes which reside in Krampus's lair. The Bedine, Saint Maud. Saint Maud follows a care worker who seeks redemption after accidentally killing a patient. After being hired by a terminally ill atheist called Amanda, Maud believes that she can save her own soul if she convinces her new patient to accept God, as God is apparently talking to Maud directly. But after acting erratically, Maud is fired, causing her instability to worsen. After confronting Amanda once more near the end, she is seemingly possessed by a demon, urging Maud to kill her. In doing so and believing that she has fulfilled her task, Maud Maud walks onto a beach and then sets herself on fire so that she can ascend into heaven. As she ignites the flames though, angelic wings appear on her back, causing onlookers to then suddenly kneel before her to bask in her angelic glory. Throughout the movie, Maud comes across as an unreliable narrator, so it's kind of hard in the moment to tell whether she did speak to God or maybe the devil or if it was just in her own mind. But upon watching her take on the appearance of an angel at the end, the audience then wonders whether she was actually chosen by God or all along. However, in the final, final seconds, the rug is swept beneath our feet yet again. In the very last shot, the screen cuts to Maud screaming in agony as the flames char her body to the bone. It's a jarring, powerful shot, and one that definitely leaves an impression. Number 8, American Psycho. American Psycho centers around a Wall Street nutter called Patrick Bateman. He's handsome, he's successful, and astoundingly rich, but unfortunately, he also likes to dissect girls and is utterly insane. Even though Bateman is usually able to separate his love of murder from his personal life, he becomes more unhinged as the story progresses. After seeing him try to feed a cat to an ATM machine, I mean, hey, who hasn't done that at 2am during a big sesh, and then hacking a woman to pieces with a chainsaw, alright, that one's a little bit more unique, viewers naturally assume that the movie is going to conclude with the titular psychopath performing the most unspeakable act of evil possible. But in the final scene, his lawyer informs him that Paul Allen, who Bateman supposedly killed earlier, is actually alive and well and was spotted just the other day. In that moment, Bateman and the audience has no idea what to think. Did he imagine the murder of Paul Allen? Has he ever killed anyone? Were all of his psychotic moments just in his head? We don't know. Before the viewer has as a chance to process this revelation, the screen suddenly cuts to black. Number 7, The Neon Demon. The Neon Demon follows a teenager called Jessie who moves to LA to pursue a modeling career. Because of her striking features, Jessie finds herself catapulted to the highest ranks of the fashion industry almost immediately. She's on top of the world, oblivious that her competitors, Ruby, Gigi, and Sarah, are actually preparing her downfall. So what do the other models do? Do they ruin her career? Do they get her fired? Do they mess up her looks? Well, no. They literally decide to 
eat her. They convince themselves that they can absorb Jessie's beauty by devouring her flesh, and so they chop her up, gorge on her flesh, and then bathe in her blood. Ruby then completes the ritual by urinating a torrent of blood on Jessie's grave. While at a modeling shoot the day after, Gigi becomes overwhelmed with guilt and suddenly vomits up Jessie's eyeball. She then gouges her stomach open, desperate to get her out of me. Sarah, on the other hand, has absolutely no qualms about her actions and eats the regurgitated eyeball, hoping to absorb even more of Jessie's beauty. It's a totally unhinged finale and one that leaves you thinking about what the hell you just watched. Number six, The Devil Inside. In The Devil Inside, a filmmaker called Isabella decides to put a documentary together to understand why her mother killed three clergymen 20 years ago. Upon investigation, Isabella comes to the realization that her mother's actions were caused by, what else, demonic possession. Because The Devil Inside was set to remix elements of The Blair Witch Project and The Exorcist, it looked like it had potential at the time. The fact that the story was also supposedly based on true events also encouraged millions of viewers to flock to see the docu-horror in its opening weekend. As a result, the film recouped a hundred times its budget, but The Devil Inside became infamous for its ending, or, well, lack thereof. See, in the final scene, Isabella becomes possessed while in a moving car. As the demon transfers itself into the driver, he then crashes into an oncoming vehicle, killing everybody inside. Then, the screen suddenly cuts to black with a title card advising viewers to check out the website, quote, for more information on the ongoing investigation. Although there's a lot of horror films that leave viewers scratching their heads, it's you usually because of a last minute jump scare or a shocking twist, not because the film itself was too lazy to have an ending. Number 5. Suspiria 2018 like the 1977 version of Suspiria, the 2018 remake follows an American dancer called Susie who joins a ballet academy, unaware that it is a coven of witches. Even though Susie is happy when she excels in her training, the matriarchs intend to use her body as a vessel for the high witch Marcos, who claims to be the fabled Mother Suspiriorum. As the story draws to a close, Susie is invited into the coven's secret chambers where she comes face to face with Marcos, a vile creature composed of pus-leaking skin, fetal limbs, and a whole lot of other creepy creepy stuff. And then, somehow, the ending gets weirder. In fact, people who've watched the original Suspiria will be even more shocked by the remake's climax. See, in the 1977 version, Susie confronts Mother Suspiriorum and then kills her, but in the remake, Susie reveals to the witches that she has secretly been Mother Suspiriorum the entire time, while Marcos is a fraud. To punish the coven for following a false prophet, she calls all of Marcos's followers to explode in spectacularly gory fashion. Even though the film has a lot of deeply disturbing imagery, nothing can prepare viewers for this gruesome but admittedly awesome conclusion. Number 4. In the Mouth of Madness in In the Mouth of Madness, John Trent is an investigator who's tasked with tracking down pulp horror writer Sutter Kane, who has vanished on the eve of his new book's release. Believing Kane's disappearance to be only a publicity stunt to promote his new book, Trent is certain that he will find the writer in one piece. But as Trent stumbles upon all sorts of otherworldly horrors, he becomes terrified that he may lose his life, his mind, and his soul, as it turns out that he's actually a character created by Kane whose stories are now coming to life. After Trent encounters Cthulhu-esque monsters, demon children, and tentacled mortel keepers, it's no surprise that he ends up in a psychiatric institution by the end. He eventually gets out though thanks to monsters taking over the entire world. Upon learning that he is basically woken up in the apocalypse, Trent does what any normal person would do in that situation. He goes straight to the cinema to see the movie adaptation of In the Mouth of Madness. Watching himself on the big screen and everything that's already happened in his life, Trent maniacally laughs to himself before breaking down in tears. So, what happened? Is Trent crazy? Is he a character in Kane's novel? Is it a little bit of both or something in between? You decide. Number 3. Evil Dead 2013 even though the Evil Dead trilogy seemingly wrapped in 1992, fans of Sam Raimi's iconic Zomcoms are wanted more. Much like the Deadites themselves, it seemed like the franchise just couldn't stay buried. So, fans were thrilled when another entry was greenlit in 2013, simply called Evil Dead. Although us fans hoped that the latest edition would have some direct connection to the original film, 2013's Evil Dead was more of a straightforward remake, although it did switch up who you thought the hero would be. Anyone who stuck around to watch the post credit scene 
scenes, though, had something of a different thought. See, after the credits, there is a single shot of the hero of the original films, Ash Williams, saying his iconic catchphrase of groovy before turning to face the camera. Now, even though this was probably nothing more than me a fan service, many viewers got more excited by this post credit scene than the movie itself. Many speculated online that this sequence could prove that everyone's favourite chainsaw-wielding hero would appear in the sequel, which was furthered by the producers, as they were discussing the possibility of a sequel that merged the original trilogy with the remake universe. But eventually, just like the fabled Evil Dead 4, it was all for naught. Although Bruce Campbell did reprise his role in a TV series titled Ash vs. the Evil Dead, Ash Williams has yet to appear in another movie, and thanks to Bruce Campbell now retiring the role, it's unlikely he ever will. Number 2. Drag Me to Hell Speaking of Sam Raimi, in his great film Drag Me to Hell, a loan officer called Christine Brown is told by her boss that she's too soft to get promoted. In order to prove him wrong, she refuses to give out a loan to a woman called Ganush, resulting in her losing her house. Furious, Ganush places a hex on Christine's button, condemning her to hell. Although Christine tries to make peace with the old lady, that becomes impossible when she pops her clocks. After being tormented with hallucinations, possession, and nightmarish nosebleeds, God, I hate those myself. Christine learns that she can pass on the hex by offering her cursed button to another person. Tempted to give the button to a colleague that she hates, she decides instead to place it on Ganush's grave, seemingly reversing the hex. But in the climax, Christine realizes that she accidentally gave up the wrong button, meaning that she's still in possession of the cursed one. Before she has a chance to remedy this, the horde of demons burst from the ground and cast her down to hell. Even though there are a lot of horror films where the protagonist winds up dead, viewers really thought that Christine would make it out of this alive. Number 1. The Shining Yep, could it have been anything else? In The Shining, struggling author Jack Torrance agrees to a caretaking position at the Overlook Hotel, unaware that it's haunted. Moving in with his wife Wendy and his son Danny, Jack feels like this is the perfect opportunity for him to finish his book. Yeah, there's a lot of entries about writers trying to finish their books and going mad on this list. I don't know what it is about that process that just makes for good horror, I guess. Anyway, after the spirits of the hotel prey on Jack's vices, which are, funnily enough, other kinds of spirits, he goes insane and tries to murder his family. Luckily, Wendy and Danny lose Jack in a blizzard and escape, and unable to find his way back to the hotel, Jack freezes to death. Just as everything looks like it's wrapping up, we cut to the hotel's interior, where the camera zooms in on a picture of a party at the Overlook Hotel, with Jack Torrance in the bottom centre. The camera slowly pans down, showing the picture was taken in 1921, 59 years before the events in the movie. Theories have raged about what this means for decades, and there is no question that The Shining has one of the biggest WTF endings in the history of cinema. So, that's our list. I want to know what you guys think down in the comments below. What did you think about these horror movie endings? Do you have any interpretations for The Shining or anything like that as well? And are there any that you would have put on here? While you're letting us know, could you please give us a like, share, subscribe, and head over to What Culture Horror for more lists like this on the regular. Even if you don't though, I've been Josh. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon.